welcome to webinar series hosted by Happiest Health. I'm Revati and I will be your host for today's session. It is said that fitness is 80% diet and 20% exercise. Now that can be 70, 30 or 75, 25. But the bottom line is what you eat is as important or more important than the exercises that you do. You work out perfectly, but don't, re but don't eat right. Or you eat right, but you don't move at all. Neither of this will work. In today's session titled Fitness and Nutrition and How They Complement Each Other, we'll discuss this and more. For this, we have with us uh, two panel members. Uh, one of them is uh, on the way, so we'll uh, get Sharanya Shastri introduced first. Sharanya, welcome to the panel. Thank you, thank you. Sharanya is a nutritionist who holds double master's degrees in sports nutrition from ISST Pune and in therapeutic dietic, uh, dietics in up and applied nutrition from Manipal. Currently, she is based in Delhi. So uh, we hope to have a very, um, you know, day-to-day -day, realistic perspective on how nutrition is important as far as fitness is concerned. Welcome again, uh, Sharanya. Right. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Yes, Sharanya. Yeah, I said thanks. Thanks for that warm introduction. Welcome. Uh, our other panelist <laughs> is Arun Bhattacharya. He's a certified pers personal trainer and sports nutritionist, as well as a celebrity and lifestyle coach based in Hyderabad. Uh, we were awaiting um, for him joining on the session. Before we move on to the questions, I'd like to make a quick announcement for the attendees of today's session that we have a Move Fitness Summit on the 8th of June at St. John's Auditorium in Bengaluru starting 9 a.m. And during this session, we have various uh, topics that will be covered with regards to fitness and nutrition. Uh, to start with we'll have a keynote addressed by uh Spo um, Athletic Federation of India Vice President Anju Bobby George, following which we have sessions on finding time for fitness, muscle and bone health, fitness and weight management, panel on injury prevention and exercise regimen. So register for this uh, session today. You'll also get a special discount. The coupon code and the registration link will be shared in the chat box. A quick uh, thank you to our sponsors as well, Active Nutrition Partner Health, uh, Nestle Health Science, Senior Fitness Partner Atulia, Fitness Tracking Partner Abo, Fitness Partner Lifelong, Fitness Circuit Partner Chisel, and Wellbeing Partner Medifit. With that, we start with today's session. Uh, I'll dive into the quest of, set of questions that we have. Uh, Sharanya, uh, first question, uh, from a nutrition standpoint, how can people identify the best exercise program to complement their dietary goals like for some it is weight uh, weight loss for some it is muscle gain for some it is just improvement in health right so um so this is a very tricky part to answer you know because uh, like in nutrition when we talk about there is no one size fits all um i don't know how many of them know it because Often and not often and more, we always tend to compare what we are eating with somebody else's plate. Like this is so, this one's eating a lot. This one's not eating at all. What diet are you following? So when you have to really think about your own goals, whether it's like losing weight, putting on weight, increasing on your muscle mass. So it's very important that primarily you understand your body composition, your body as a whole, what are your genetics, what kind of a metabolism you have or you've been having. Uh, it's very important that first to understand your body and only then you'll be able to understand if something is suiting you or not so um, so everything every nutrition plan has to be tailor-made that's what I'm trying to say and depending on the goal so what kind of nutrients to include changes so more or less we all only talk about carbs protein and fat everybody wants to include more protein everybody wants to cut down on carbs everybody wants to do you know that's the same thing which goes on on every social media platform or everybody is just you know advocating the same but it's also about the minor things like your body genetics which plays a major role also about your other parameters like your hair and skin quality okay or your energy levels and in females what about your menstrual cycles if it's regular irregular your hormonal you know uh, fluctuations or changes so in order to design a diet plan irrespective of whatever goal you have whether it's muscle gain muscle loss you want to lose weight you want to put on weight it's very very important that first you get the things right apart from the macros you get your micros right like you know if you have a lot of cravings if you are very prone to falling ill so you get your micros right automatically macros will fall in place it might sound a little like you know i'm saying it a little ulta than what people generally talk and only then you will have your nutrition plan intact otherwise if you only go by the usual 
macros of carbs protein and fat you will never understand what your body is made of what are its requirements and what are the problems that you face because most of them do lose weight like in my practice in 4 years i have seen that people do lose weight it's not impossible but the problem is sustaining there most of them again put on on that weight within a month or two and it happens even more faster so to understand all this it's no longer about bmi it's no longer about the weight and the weighing scale it's about the bmr and to understand bmr or the basal metabolic rate you need to first get your body uh, you know in a in that form or you need to first start analyzing yourself that way that you don't really you know go read it wrong so for that you need to know what you are actually made of what you have been what have you grown up eating what is the region that you stay where is your you know the geography all of these things do play a role right now uh, you did touch upon the importance of micros uh, you know when it comes to diet uh, people focus solely on calories for weight loss like you said uh, focusing on protein and saying cut down on carbs while all of them are important can you explain the importance of micronutrients and how they contribute to overall health and fitness if you can tell us in detail yeah yeah so without getting a lot too technical i would like to give this comparison of probably this point of view so back uh, uh, if you go around like 20 30 years back under developing countries like you know africa being one of them where people died out of hunger i mean you we all have seen that uh, you know pictures in our textbooks where kids are all malnourished and you know they're so skinny and their ribs are protruding so that was the time when people died out of hunger like there was no food and people did not even have access to bare minimum food but i think off late with uh, where with you know so much of diet and the fancy culture being around now there's something called the rich hunger which is you know i think prevailing we have access to food we have that money or probably the financial stability but still we choose to starve and why do we choose to starve because we want to weigh a particular weight on the weighing scale or probably we want to impress somebody or we have some deadline which is like a wedding or a small party coming up the weekend so the rich hunger is where you purposely deliberately starve you don't want to eat just because you want to have that short term goal achieved but at the same time in this whole, whole process so for again the carb protein fat playing around the major thing that is taking a miss is micronutrients so that is how important is micro so from that zamana where people didn't have food and really had a problem to this zamana where you have access probably food is also like 20 minutes away but still we choose not to eat and just to you know get a superficial goal so that is where micronutrients take a hit uh, micronutrients again comprises of your calcium iron zinc vitamins and all of that and then what happens is we start you know seeing the hair fall we start the skin you know is not really up to the mark and then we all again succumb to external things like we purchase cosmetics and products which help you in getting a better better skin and better hair probably we just spending that money elsewhere so this is the trend this is probably the marketing strategy or this is probably the existing trend that happens that you cut down on food but you spend more money on your cosmetics or at your parlors or you know doing more face masks and all of that at home so this is how micronutrients are going for a toss in the diet because earlier people did not really need an external agent or an external thing to put something on their hair and skin or on their body to look a little fairer or a little more you know glamorous or to glow right so uh, this is what is this is how important the micronutrients are and this is how you know we are not really paying attention to it okay so a major part of uh, anybody looking beautiful is has got to do with what they really eat what is eat. exactly what is exactly so i don't know like olden days you know you have your grandmothers they always used to take this vegetable peels and used to make a chutney out of it they would just take the banana peel and apply it on their skin so you know nothing used to go waste um we lost you there or probably we don't do that uh, am i audible yes now you are we missed the last i said i said yeah i said you know in the olden days we had our grannies use the banana peel we had them use it for making chutneys or banana peel you again they used to apply it superficially on their skin every day having that amla was very important either in the form of a pickle or probably one you know orange or something you know 
it was more seasonal it was more local it was more affordable nobody was really behind avocados and guacamole in fancy sophisticated terms it was more to do with where you're growing up what locality you're in what region you're in and it was more simpler i think with time it has become so complicated and that is why we succumb to a lot of beauty ads and social media influencers so it's very simple your beauty is just about what you eat what you eat um sharanya you mentioned about the bmr instead of bmi uh, the metabolic rate yeah. now uh, when it comes to somebody who is strength training how can strength training really benefit someone's metabolism and also support their weight management goals yeah so strength training basically increases your lean body mass or your muscle mass so that is why we always advocate i'm sure the fitness you know expert will be able to you know shed more light on this where we encourage people irrespective of the gender men or women to lift weights you know so with this what happens is you enter into the fat burning zone or you actually burn more calories after an exercise so whenever your muscles get active and uh, you strength train for like good 30 minutes or 40 minutes or initially even starting with 20 you tend to burn more calories after the workout which happens only in strength training and that is where your metabolism increases so even if you eat something post your whatever workout you tend to burn more calories and that is what is important right to increase your metabolism you need to keep your calorie expenditure high so that is how strength training holds a benefit over your other forms of exercises all right uh, so not really eat less exercise more again like we've been saying from the beginning eat enough exercise enough basically uh, eat all uh, different kinds of food don't skip on something and then compensate for that with uh, something else uh, like a cosmetic procedure like you were pointing out right um, next question to you um, sharanya is uh, there are many dietary approaches and initially it would be three or four different approaches now but with social media and with a new influencer coming on our uh, phone on our social media feed every other day you're getting to hear different kinds of diet um, you have the keto diet mediterranean diet and all of these different things can you explain the role of exercise in different dietary patterns and how to ensure they are sustainable for long term fitness goals and to begin with are these sustainable at all for everyone yeah so the first question that you asked me like are these sustainable the answer is no i might be like you know breaking a lot of hearts here by saying no but that's the fact because in my practice whatever i have seen yes people do this short term diets of keto and mediterranean only because they have an immediate goal coming up like somebody is getting married or you know most of these are very uh, highly influenced by social media probably actors because somebody some actor tells in that interview that i was on a keto or i was on xyz diet so people do pick it up from there having said that uh, what we really need to understand in reality is a person who is doing it as a full time job or a profession has a very different need and a requirement versus somebody like you and me who is sitting and discussing this so for us in a, on a long term basis it's not sustainable because we are not doing you know that full time whatever that xyz is doing we are normal people leading a normal life more or less a sedentary lifestyle where we can afford 40 minutes to you know 1 hour of gym or max a 1 and 1/2 hour of gym or exercise so when these diets you which you start for keeping a short term goal in mind as long as it's short term you're probably getting married or you have a party to attend it works okay but the minute that is over it all pounces back so coming to the sustainable part of it it is definitely not sustainable and all the more females are very hormonally vibrant so there are a lot of people who end up having a lot of side effects because there are a lot of hormonal changes that happen so yes i do not really advocate any of these um, diets as long as the other person really asks me to and they really have something coming up but as a person in my own practice i do not really advocate because these are not sustainable and coming to the main question of what is the thing that holds you or what uh, you know how it supports your exercise and all of that anything which is simple anything which is doable for a longer run over a longer run anything which makes you stress the least about food is what you have to follow we have enough things to worry about in life i don't think you know food should also be one of them where you are really weighing your food where you are weighing the calories where you are breaking your head about what to eat what not to eat and spending extra money on that simpler it is the easier it is 
the best it is for you so that means that just follow everything in moderation that's very very important and yeah keeping in mind if you have a metabolic syndrome if you have some metabolic disorder like whatever diabetes or hypertension the diet has to be tailor made but if you're asking for a normal person simpler homemade easier whatever is easily available local cuisine is the best and along with that a decent amount of exercise which suits your body type like i said you need to analyze your body type so if you're somebody who's very rigid if you're somebody who's very flexible so any uh, exercise which is unstructured or structured like strength training or unstructured like playing a sport or dancing any any of these things when done over a longer period in a very consistent mat manner will definitely keep you healthy you don't really have to be very fancy you don't really have to be very sophisticated i mean yes uh, if you have the time if you have the money and if it's something that you're doing full time you can but considering that all of us have different things to stress about worry about in life i think the simpler it is the easier it is i think that's what we all should choose right that brings me to my next question when you talk about um, uh, not stressing about food or exercise for that matter uh, one of the concerns people have is i don't have time for any of this i don't have time to you know eat healthy or prepare healthy uh, food before a workout and things like that now when you are working out there is of course a certain foods that you can cannot eat in terms of the timing you know you don't eat a heavy meal and then go hit the gym so do you have any tips for people who would like to uh make some quick snacks before they go for their workout or after they work out that they can uh, prepare quick recipes or snacks right so um see whenever you're planning to work out again if it's something like a gym session or it depends on what kind of work workout you're talking about if it's a yoga then probably you will not eat a heavy meal and go it will just be like probably a glass of lukewarm water and, and a fruit if it's a very intense yoga session but if it's again a very intense gym session where you're lifting where you're exerting then a pre workout and a post workout becomes very important a pre workout is usually something which is rich in carbs again how much rich in carbs is again very different it is very um, you know subjective to the person's workout session or the training session and a post workout is generally something which is protein based so if i assume that somebody is having a simple gym session like basic half an hour to 40 minutes then a pre workout can, can be a good fruit or probably an, a nice smoothie which is having a fruit you know fruit and a nut based one and a post workout will be something which is protein based so even depending on what time of the day you're working out if you're working out in the morning you can have a meal later like you know it can be either your breakfast or dinner so but let it be more of protein like where you have a, a whole grain where you have lentil so when i say more protein people have this idea of they completely avoid carbs and they start only eating protein that's not what i'm talking about that can again give you a lot of gut related issues so when i say more protein i don't mean to say you cut down on the carb i say when i mean that it's it means that you have your roti you have your rice or whatever along with that probably you can have an extra katori of your dal or your lentil or your chicken or your egg or fish the days you have worked out so that is what i mean by a protein rich post workout and a carb rich pre workout okay so protein rich food does not mean zero carbs it's a exactly. plate that we're looking at here and yes. carbs before workout and protein after workout after workout yes but again depending on how intense this workout is going to be if you are so it's very subjective so if somebody is doing a very strenuous workout then it makes more sense if you're just going for a walk if you're just going for a yoga session you don't really need a very carb rich pre workout it can just be like a small fruit or just maybe half a juice half a glass of a glass of a juice something like that all right and is it beneficial to work out on an empty stomach especially for weight loss goals yeah so this is something that offlet has become very popular that you see that there are fasted workouts so when you work out on an empty stomach you tend to burn fat more but the intensity of the workout is very important so you do a fasted workout like probably a yoga or even maybe 30 to 40 minutes of a gym session does give you results this is what generally i advocate in my practice 
but very importantly and in bold and in italics and in underline it has to be a very uh, medium to light intensity workout on a fasted and in a fasted stomach or in a fasted state you cannot and you're not supposed to do something like a very you know power lifting or a very strenuous workout then it's something that's not advisable as long as it's a mix of little bit of cardio to you know yaha waha little bit of strength training then it is okay so light to medium intensity workout is supported very well in a fasted state but again very importantly if it's something very very intense then you cannot or it's not advisable to do in a fasted state yeah right of course you also need the energy to be able to do that rigorous exactly. workout you can't push yourself too much as well in that sense right thanks sharan yeah. before we head into the next set of questions a quick reminder to our attendees if you have any questions um during this session please leave them in the chat box we will be taking the questions at the end of the session sharanya and uh, uh, the other panelist will answer these questions so remember to share your questions in the chat box there's a q and a box where you can share the questions and uh, our move fitness summit is happening on the 8th of june at the st john's auditorium in bengaluru it starts at 9 a.m where you will have uh, similar sessions like these covering various aspects of uh, fitness and nutrition and you'll also get to meet experts from across the field uh, registration for which is uh, still on you can register uh, using the link in the chat box there's also a special discount and the coupon code will also be shared in the chat box with that uh, we move into the next set of questions that we have sharanya uh, we talked all about food nutrition micronutrients carbs proteins and all of these uh, another important aspect is hydration uh, what role does you know drinking adequate water play in all of these when it comes to health and fitness and how does it impact exercise performance and recovery as well can you offer some tips as well to stay hydrated hydrated yeah right so hydration is again very important so i don't really have to tell you what happens if you don't drink enough of water it's basic can be dehydration and you know considering the kind of temperatures that we have now whether it's bangalore or i i live in delhi for now so you cannot really have a comparison so it is very very important starting from a dehydration to a heat stroke which is so common you know in places like delhi and up and all of that so when it comes to exercise and performance again it's very important how much of water you drink before an exercise how much of water you're drinking during the workout and how much you're drinking post workout right so generally uh, we 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 generally what we suggest is have at least uh, you know 500 ml of water at least 30 minutes before the workout okay and during your exercise is something that we don't really encourage a lot of water water because people uh, have the tendency to feel a little bloated so we generally suggest something like an isotonic drink so isotonic drink is something like your electrolyte like you know something like a mix of your little bit of salt and sugar and then water so that you know it is giving the body is getting electrolytes right like whatever sodium or whatever is being lost and then post workout is very important so depending on so we have something called a sweat rate analysis which we do and which uh, again this is for people who are doing an intense workout so the amount of you know your water that you have lost before uh, you know you exercise so when you weigh yourself um suppose let's say you've lost 2 kgs you know after the workout so that much of uh, water like 2 liters of water has to be supplemented not immediately but over the next 3 to 4 hours of you know time period so that is very important if you are somebody who is into you know extreme gymming and extreme fitness but uh, people who are into simple exercises like if you work out for 30 40 minutes i don't see you that i don't think there's a weight loss that happens so this is the role of water so very importantly pre workout and during the workout is very important and again post for people who have lost that weight you need to supplement it with that many liters of water so for every 1 kg of water loss you need to supplement it with 1 liter of water after the workout uh so again so the best way to keep yourself hydrated is always sip water during the workout don't really drink a lot of it and i would not instead of having plain water it's always better to have this isotonic drink like whatever is homemade like you know little bit of salt sugar and water 
and pre workout make sure you're not drinking a lot of water at once so even drinking water there is a pattern a lot of people end up drinking a lot of water after a meal which is not suggested and uh, before the workout like 10 15 minutes before again if you drink a lot of water so that time period is very important because you drink water in a very irregular pattern then obviously you feel like using the washroom which is a practical difficulty and then you feel bloated so hydration really plays a role in your or pre and post workout and on the whole you know to keep yourself hydrated what i would suggest is don't wait until your mouth gets dry just sip water maybe once in half an hour to 40 minutes you know as in when we're talking and you know you're sitting and have doing some work so that keeps your hydration in a good way so instead of drinking a lot of water and gulping a lot of water at once it's better to have it you know in that once in a half once in 30 to 40 minutes so that's a good way to hydrate yourself all right. Thanks, Sharanya. Uh, we have the other panelist, uh, Mr. Arun, who's joined the session. Welcome to the panel, Arun. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm extremely sorry that I <laughs> delayed in joining the call, but I, I've been hearing the other uh, speaker, and I think she's been giving you guys some amazing information. Yes. So we uh, were talking a lot about uh, nutrition and uh, the other aspect of it, the fitness part of it, uh, we'll now get into since you have joined. Uh, before we begin, if I could quickly request you to uh, keep your phone horizontally. Sure. Sure. Rotate the screen and we are good to go. Hi, Just Arun. Welcome. I think you will have a lot Hi, of... Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Right, so I've, second, I've, I've, started, I've started, you know, the ball rolling, I got it rolling by answering a bit of the fitness part on strength training. I'm sure you'll do more justice to it. It's, it's all a team effort at the end of the day. So, right. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've already given these guys a good gist and probably I'll just add some more information to that. Right. Yeah, so right. we'll move to the questions for Arun and uh, Sharanya, uh, a short break for you until we have the yeah. fitness aspects of it uh, discussed. But I'd request you to keep the video on and stay with us for the discussion. Um, Arun, um, from a fitness perspective, a lot of people, uh, you know, go to the gym or do other workouts for that matter and focus a lot on exercising, exercising. And the one part they probably focus on is protein and uh, certain uh, diets that they hear about, uh, you know, influencers talking about. How are nutritional re requirements different, uh, you know, for different fitness goals and how important is it? So I always um, approach this with extreme precaution because there is so much misinformation that exists in this arena. Um, there is the scientific literature that gives us certain guidelines. Um, then there are the WHO guidelines that, you know, people tend to fall back on. And then, of course, there are the um, fit influencers or the influencers, the, the whole, uh, what I call Instagram education or social, social media education where people are literally selling their own hypothesis. So I always um, approach this um, with some basic instructions which i have learned and i think these are tools that anybody um, who is starting their fitness journey can follow regardless of their if their goal is fat loss muscle gain um, be it um, you know a, a sport oriented goal or just being fit so first things first you need a lot of protein but then you don't need to overdo it as well so a lot of scientific literature talks about eating like a gram of protein per pound of weight and things like that. But um, first thing that I always try telling people is try to get most of your protein through wholesome foods. Not that supplements are bad for you in any way, but whenever you're starting your journey, if you're already starting to depend on a supplement, then you're not creating a very strong foundation. So when you reach a point when eating food becomes a challenge, and at that point, if you're adding a protein supplement of some sort, then that's fine. But at least in the initial stages, just try to get enough protein just through food. And it could just be as basic as following the WHO guidelines, which is get one gram of protein per kg of body weight. Just start from there. And the thing that is more important about protein than just uh, getting the right quantity is also 
having a decent amount of protein in every meal that you eat. Now, whether you eat three meals, five meals, whatever it is. So just have these basic habits as a foundation where you're getting at least maybe 10, 15, 20 grams of protein per meal um, coming from wholesome food sources, whether it's uh, low-fat paneer, tempeh, tofu, uh, pulses, legumes for vegetarians, vegans, or when it comes to non-vegetarians, of course, they have a plethora of choices. But just get a sufficient amount of protein in each meal. And of course, make sure that you're getting the net protein intake that you're sort of targeting. Um, end of the day, it's more about staying invested in that habit on a day-to-day -day basis. And one thing that I always recommend people is that when you're trying to add more protein in the diet, you have to simultaneously add a lot of fiber. Okay. Because Indians, typically being very deficient in protein, when you suddenly add a lot of protein under the guidance of a coach or a trainer or whoever it is, there is a very high chance that your bowels can, can literally go in shock and there is a possibility you may get constipation or some other discomfort in the gut. So getting enough protein is good, but it's also important that you complement it with enough fiber. Um, a very common feedback I get from people when they increase their protein intake is, I'm getting a lot of this heating feel, you know, I'm getting acne and all of that. And then they look at me and they're like, how is it that you eat protein, like so much protein in your food and then your skin is absolutely clear? First of all, I hydrate a lot, which is something she was talking about just a while ago. And uh, the second thing is I have a lot of vegetables with each meal. Um, so getting vegetables, the primary objective of eating vegetables is getting sufficient fiber. So if you are just eating vegetables like cucumber or tomatoes, yeah, they're vegetables technically, but they don't have sufficient fiber. Unless you're eating vegetables like bittergourd, spinach, French beans, uh, you know, broccoli, you're not getting enough fiber. So you need to look into those aspects as well. In fact, I encourage people to do more of native vegetables that are more native to India. That yeah. automatically we give us a lot more fiber rather than just trying to eat vegetables which are more of namesake vegetables. Cucumber is mostly just water, same yeah. as with tomatoes. Um, capsicum and all have some fiber, but they're not a lot. Um, onions and all, not that much. So you right. need to pick your vegetables, you know, very selectively as well. So getting enough protein is important. Getting sufficient fiber is important. Now, yeah. when you have addressed the aspects then once the foundation is built and then depending on whatever sport whatever goals you have you can plus or minus your protein basis that but a different discussion altogether that is very specific to your goals so for example if you are somebody who is into strength training you want to gain muscle then perhaps eating one and a half grams of lower body weight is also going to be very you know helpful for you mm -hmm. um but at the same time, like, for example, a lot of times, a lot of clients who come to me for weight loss, they come and tell me, why are you giving me so much protein? The thing is, especially in fat loss, what happens is when you're trying to draw body fat, and I don't know if you made a note of this, I just went from saying weight loss to fat loss. Yeah. Because when people come to me for weight loss, I always tell them, you, gen you necessarily don't want to lose muscle mass. I think we've uh, lost yeah, we with Arun. Yeah. Um, Sorry, guys, I lost you there for a bit. Um, so did you guys did you hear the last bit that I said? We talk about weight loss versus fat loss. Yes. So when people come to me and talk about weight loss, I immediately correct them and say that you ideally want to draw body fat, not just, you know, not your muscle mass, of course, not your bone density. So having sufficient protein in a catabolic phase where you're trying to draw body fat is going to help you protect your muscles. That's the whole role of making sure that you get enough protein. So a lot of times people think, oh, I'm in a fat loss or a weight loss journey. Why do I need so much protein? Because you don't want to lose the muscle mass that you have. Perhaps right. you may even gain some muscle mass in that same phase. Right. Arun, um, it, there are a lot of uh, 
newbies who come for workout as well, you you would have seen that even after consistently working out, they may come to you and complain saying, you know, I'm not losing weight at all. Because like you said, uh, the focus is on weight loss and not fat loss uh, sometimes. And also uh, to understand the difference between the two. Now, what are the top three, you know, very common mistakes that people make when it comes to nutrition and fitness? Sorry. Are you are you asking this question for? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> With regards to fitness, what are the top three mistakes that you see them making? Sleep is definitely one of the top. Uh, I don't we lost you there. Could you repeat the first one again, people please? Just um, my partner or my everybody saying. No, it's still poor. The network is a little sketchy. Um, just give me a second, guys, please. Uh, while we wait for Arun, um, Sharon, yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes to eating, not just, uh, you know, following these fad diets or not just following these uh, uh, misinformation, but there's also emotional eating. Some people do struggle with emotional eating. Now, can you uh, discuss the connection between food and mood and offer strategies for developing a healthy relationship with food? Because emotional eating is also a, a big concern for many. Yeah. So eating disorders are something which have always lasted. Maybe it's come into, you know, a lot of limelight now because uh, I don't know if you all know, even uh, Princess Diana was one of the victim for this eating disorder where you have anorexia and bulimia and stuff like that. So people, um, so the, the whole thing comes down to one thing when you're not happy with the way you look at, you know, at yourself, like basically it all comes down to, it's more, you know, psychological and, you know, it's also related to the eating that, you know, induces this kind of uh, crazy eating. So uh, it, it all comes down to body acceptance and self-confidence and self-love. So when you're, when you're not really happy with the way you look, right? So that that's what sometimes, you know, gets you into this. So that's one way of looking at it. And the other way is also, uh, it has a lot to do with your gut health. So um, there's a Harvard study now which says, you know, there's a gut brain axis which says that whatever you eat or however you feel, so your, you know, mood is related to what you eat. So it's all about a lot of factors, the psychological aspect coming in. It's also got to do with your gut health. And that is why nowadays people, you know, uh, focus a lot on gut health. So but everything put to a Together in one thing, eating disorders are mainly to do with somebody who's not having enough amount of body acceptance or they don't really like the way they are in, you know, whatever shape they are. So for that, we have anorexia and bulimia and all of that. So how do you really correct this is... Uh, uh, quickly add to that, sorry to cut you, but quickly yeah. to add to that, not just eating disorders, but also um, people who are eating because I'm stressed. You know, yeah, eating, stress eating, overeating, and yeah. you, you know, know, not to the level of a disorder, but disorder, but yeah, stress yeah, eating exactly. Emotional eating, basically. emotional eating, like you know, all of us, I think, have gone through that or we go through on a day to day basis. Like somebody shouts at you, you're stressed, we overeat. So, yeah, when it becomes extreme, then it becomes a disorder, like where it goes up to anorexia. But mainly, food and emotions have that connect. That's where your gut brain axis comes into picture. So, how do you keep that connect intact? Is when you have a balanced meal, like how Arun was talking about having that balanced meal, that local meal in every aspect, you know, having that equal amount of protein, fiber, and carbs. So, wh why do you get that, you know, stress level or why do you crave? Like most of them have this craving post lunch especially around this time this 4 to 7 p.m that window is the most dangerous window where most of them feel like having a sweet they crave for something like a savory so that craving happens only as your stress levels or your cortisol levels goes down during the day as the day progresses and that is where the importance of your balanced meal comes into picture so balanced is not only in terms of protein fiber carbs so that is where your micronutrients help so including things like a simple hack for all those who have a 
sweet tooth and who have a sugar craving is including Ceylon cinnamon water post lunch. If you're somebody who has that 4 p.m. you know sweet craving, you can include that. So that balances your micronutrient. Having a bit of ghee on your roti. I'm talking about homemade ghee. I'm not talking about the processed one. If at all you have access and you're lucky enough to have that bit of homemade ghee on your ghee, I mean on your roti or your rice and sambar. So that takes care of that, you know, craving. So basically when all the nutrients, macros and micros, when put together, comes as a balanced plate, right? So that is when you don't have space for this craving. So that is when you can handle it better. And addressing the stress craving or the, you know, that emotional eating, I think it's also to do, got a lot to do about sleep. I think Arun was about to talk about that, like when, when we lost him. So it's about sleep, how, how, you know, how you are able to handle that stress. So because food is the first go-to thing whenever you're stressed, right? Like you either stop eating or you overeat or you kind of, you know, junk eat and all of that. So handling your sleep, your stress, basically it's about an overall picture is about the lifestyle that one is following. So naturally, if you haven't slept well, and if you have a meeting in the evening, you're stressed, you're not in a good mood, you will feel like having that coffee or probably a dark chocolate. So it's all about, you know, it's not just one thing. And also gut health really plays a major role here. So having a good gut, again, how does that good gut come from? That good gut comes with good lifestyle, good sleep, you know, managing your stress levels. But simple hacks from the diet or the nutrition point of view, be including micronutrients in every meal like how he was talking about including protein and fiber in every meal without forgetting please do include micronutrients it yeah. means that don't keep always eating boring salads and boring foods be creative and you know try to use the age-old indian method of cooking add your spices add your garlic add, add your cinnamon add your you know, dalchini or whatever, you know, the age old traditional way of cooking, like certain times we add garlic into our tadkas, we add mustard, we add cinnamon. So these things when consumed in moderation and when not overdone, because I see a lot of people having ginger shots and cinnamon shots, you know, which makes no sense. You can have that cinnamon probably in your tea or probably in any of, you know, any of their other recipes. So when it is done in a very scientific and a traditional way in which is time tested and which is age old then you will never really have this craving because when you trace back right then people never had this emotional eating it's off late that people have developed this midnight snacking or you know stress eating because there were days where our ancestors also you know had tough times but nobody really ate a lot and you right. know this binge eating concept never came in so right. it's all about balancing and you know how good you can be you know, with your kitchen stuff and how creative can you be with your cooking, making sure that you have everything intact. Yeah. Like you've reiterated, don't stress too much about the calories or the numbers on the plate. Just make sure you yeah. have a balanced meal. Arun, before we lost uh, connection, uh, you were talking about the common mistakes that people make as far as uh, fitness is concerned and nutrition with regards to fitness is concerned. So exactly. I mean, I think she just spoke about sleep, which is primarily a huge driving factor um, in terms of how satiated you feel throughout the day because sleep obviously plays a huge role in your overall recovery. It regulates your appetite hormones. So you don't get enough sleep, your body is firing in all directions. There are some people who get crazy cravings because their grilling production is just off the roof. And there could be days when there you have no appetite because you, your, your liver just doesn't know what to do because liver is one of those organs that undergoes a lot of recovery during your sleep cycle. 70% um, of your body, 70% uh, of the recovery systems that happen in, in the body happen when you're sleeping. And getting those five, six cycles of REM and deep sleep in that seven to eight hour span is very, very important. So quality of sleep really matters and it's not just the duration as well. So sleep is something a lot of people compromise on. Not drinking enough water between meals. She was talking about, um, you know, how it is important for us to sip water. You don't obviously want to consume a lot of it, uh, you know, at once because that can actually lead you to more dehydration because you suddenly put so much volume of water inside your body. Your blood tonicity drops, kidneys decide to flush out that extra water. During that time, you lose a lot of essential salts. So sipping water, not gulping, but also making sure that you're hydrating between meals. That is another very good way to manage your cravings because when your stomach is full uh, with enough food, vegetables, all of that, along with enough hydration, 
between the meals, you automatically don't have cravings. I remember this, um, you know, growing up, my dad would keep saying whenever I would feel hungry between the meals and he'd be like, drink water. And I mean, not that he knew how that works, but somebody taught him that and then he would just keep telling me that. So um, thankfully, you know, that's another thing that people can try. And that's another thing that gets overlooked, which is sufficient hydration between meals and not just getting enough hydration throughout the day. And third is, of course, I think a, a big mistake that a lot of people make is just overthinking, lack of stress management. Um, I mean, this is a discussion I have with a lot of clients on a day-to-day -day basis where they're in absolute denial. Um, first of all, we have all the stresses that are there in these cities, whether it's environmental stress, sound pollution, the air, the water, um, you know, the radiation from whether it's a Wi-Fi, it's broadband, all that is already there the environmental stresses. Then you have psychological stresses, whether it's overthinking, you you had a fight with your partner, maybe your boss is upset with you, um, road rage, traffic. And then of course, there are physiological stresses, whether you haven't slept enough, maybe you're pushing too hard in training. Um, so all these things as a culmination, you know, is something that generally newbies tend to overlook. And they're even a lot of people who've been at it for many years, even they tend to kind of overlook these things from time to time. But yeah, these are three very fundamental things, sleep, sufficient hydration, and stress management, which a lot of people need to look at. And mm -hmm. of course, we can go on and on. We can add things about not getting enough micronutrients and other things. But I think our other panelist has already covered that to a great extent. Right. Um, to add to that, you know, what are the some of the myths and misconceptions people usually have about, you know, uh, protein and muscle building? You did mention in the beginning that protein is important. Along with that, fiber is also important. And Sharanya has explained the importance of all other micronutrients. Micronutri as well. Now, when it comes to protein and muscle building, what are the common myths and misconceptions that people usually have that you would want to break today? I think the two mistakes people make when it comes to muscle building and protein intake is I think people tend to overdo their protein intake at times and they don't eat enough carbs. When you are actually trying to gain muscle, yes, protein is there to, of course, help you build the muscle, but to in order to stimulate the muscles, in order for them to produce those metabolites, which is going to start the process of hypertrophy, you need carbs. When you eat enough sufficient carbs in whatever form you're getting it, that's when you really have the energy to push. And when you are able to push enough, you know, in the gym or whatever it is that you're doing, whichever form of resistance training that you choose to do, that's when your body produces those metabolites and that's when your muscle protein synthesis kicks in. And then if there is sufficient protein, not that much, if there is sufficient protein, then automatically your body is able to produce a lot of muscle. See, again, here, another thing people need to understand is that when you are in a fat loss phase or even in a maintenance phase, sometimes eating a good amount of protein is important. But, but when you are you know, trying to build muscle, it's your overall calories that really matter. Now, whether you are supplementing those calories by eating a lot of fat, a lot of carbs, a lot of protein, doesn't really matter. But yes, to make it easier for the body to have that energy to push, if you try to get about 20 to 25% of your calories from fat, about, let's say, 30% of the total calories from protein and the rest of it from carbohydrates. And a lot of people have major carb phobia these days, which is very sad uh, because it's very few people want to build muscle. Most people just want to lose weight. So when you suddenly talk about the importance of carbs... That, uh, can you repeat that portion control proportion, Arun? 20 to 25% of your diet? So 20 to 25% of your total calories coming from fats. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I would say... Out of that, some of it, if it comes from saturated fats also, that's very good because saturated fats are important for the production of sex hormones and other things. So if muscle building is your goal, you need a lot of testosterone and that's where saturated fats are going to support it. And of course, about 30% of the total calories coming from protein. So you've got 30, 20, 25. Let's say even if you take it as 55%, the balance 45% of your calories need to come from carbohydrates. And that sounds like a lot, but if I had to give you guys a gist, um, in total, I'm consuming somewhere around 3,100 calories right now. And I consume in total 500 grams of cooked rice in a day, 500 grams of mango, 11 slices of whole wheat bread, 100 grams of oats, 
that's the amount of carbs I eat in a day. And I'm currently at about 11% body fat. So those of you who are listening today believe that carbs are making you fat, you're wrong. Carbs are not making you fat. You're, you're fat or you're putting on fat because you're consuming a total number of calories which is putting you on surplus and those surplus calories are depositing as body fat. So if you work with a coach or if you go do a little research and figure out how much total calories that you're actually consuming and if you cut it back basis your activity levels, at which point if your body goes into deficit, then obviously by default you will start losing body fat. But to blame a single food source like carbohydrates and say, oh, I'm eating rice, that's why I'm putting on body fat or I'm eating mangoes and that's why I'm putting body fat not true. Right. I think the biggest takeaway from this conversation with you is don't fear carbs. For that matter, don't fear any of Don't fear any food. Macron. It's all about moderation. It's, okay. it's all about moderation. It's about, I mean, you know, our other panelist has been talking a lot about traditional eating and stuff like that. And, you know, when she mentioned yes. things like ghee and stuff like that, it starts watering my mouth because I grew up in a house when my dad used to give me kacha ghee every morning. Our ghee used to come from Nepal. And right now, I obviously try to get like good A2 milk ghee or, you know, whatever it is. My housekeeper, thankfully, knows how to make ghee. Um, but again, everything is in moderation. It's not that ghee is good, so like now start payloading ghee, like, you know, and then, you know, you're eating like a ton of it. Yeah. Yes. Like, for example, for me, somebody like me who tries to maintain a certain body composition has, has very strong performance goals. And even with my clients, I tell them, look, as far as your food is concerned, this is your total number of amount of fat that you can eat. Like in my case, my entire fat intake is 65 grams. Now, out of the 65 grams, about a good 40 grams of it comes from extra virgin avocado oil, which is what I use for my cooking. And the balance comes from ghee, which is what I use for, you know, some of my dressings and other things. So it's very structured. It's very structured. There's no eyeballing, nothing of that sort. But again, I'm very clear about what my performance goals are, what my body composition is like. People need not get that obsessed, but there, it does help when you have some sort of a structure, at least in some terms of portion control and things like that. Right. Right. Absolutely. And uh, end of the day, each body is different. So what we discuss here is not a substitute for medical advice, as we already say here at Happiest Health. So reach out to a professional. It could be your uh, fitness expert or a medical professional. If you have doubts about your individual goals and plans, they'll be able to tell you, you know, what works better for you, because all the information that you see out there might not work for everybody the same way. So you need to understand uh, that each one is different. Uh, with that, I have another question for you. Uh, we were talking mm -hmm. about supplements and you said how supplements should not replace meals. Uh, that was a summary of uh, what you said in the beginning. Uh, but there's a lot of conflicting information about this, especially when it comes to nutrition supplements or your vitamin uh, supplements and all of these. Uh, for sports persons or athletes or somebody who is very focused on their fitness journey, uh, when might supplement be beneficial and what should people look for uh, in a quality product? I'll throw this question for both Arun and Sharanya. Arun, you can answer first. For me, the doesn't matter who you are. If if somebody comes and asks me that, you know, tell me those few supplements that everybody has to take. Um, again, depending on your activity, whatever it is, but definitely a vitamin D, uh, a magnesium glycinate or a magnesium threonate, depending on what your magnesium requirement is. I actually suggest doing a blend of all these different magnesium salts, but magnesium for sure. Um, a B-complex if you're a vegetarian and a very high quality omega-3 if possible. Uh, these are my four go-to supplements for anybody and everybody. It doesn't matter how old you are. Dosages will vary, but definitely everybody needs to supplement these four things uh, because we just don't get sufficient amounts of them from the diet. So whether you are a geriatric who is 80 years old and is just trying to be healthy or you are a 24-year-old, you know, who is in the you know, at the peak of their sports performance, you need to supplement these. And I have seen some, some amazing athletes out there who I've had the privilege to work with being deficient in this. And it's just a massive oversight by some coaches and things like that because just the education just doesn't exist. Over and above that, I feel um, some supplements that really work from a performance perspective is definitely add creatine. You know, creatine, simple creatine monohydrate works really well. Um, if you're struggling to get enough protein, it doesn't matter whether you get it from a whey isolate or a plant protein, you can use any basic high quality protein supplement. 
Uh, and then the list goes on. Um, if from a performance perspective, again, electrolytes, very important to replenish electrolytes depending, depending on what kind of sport you are into. Um, potassium, sodium, these are very essential salts that we land up, you know, losing a lot during our training sessions or during whatever games and all that we play. So from a sports perspective, I think, you know, supplements do play a role, but do the four basic ones that I mentioned and just add stuff like a creatine for sure, a good electrolyte. Uh, again, the dosage of the electrolyte, depending on how active you are or how much do you tend to sweat. There are some people who tend to sweat more. Chances of them losing salts is higher. There are some people who sweat less. It's a very genetic thing. Some people have more sweat glands, some people have less sweat glands. But if you sweat more, you need more salt replenishment. It's, it's as simple as that. There is no ballpark figure that says that, oh, this is what is enough. And yes, RDA values are indicative, but then RDA values don't, you know, apply to a sports performance. That's why, that's why in nutrition, I always say there is general nutrition, which is RDA. There is clinical nutrition, which is very disease specific. And then there is sports nutrition, which is very performance specific. Yeah. So people obviously don't understand the distinction between the three, but they have their place in their own, in their own accord. Right, right. Sharanya, would you want to add to the supplements discussion? Yeah, I think uh, he's covered most of it. Like he said, the essentials are your vitamin D and, you know, creatine. And again, talking from a very sports specific point of view, because I deal with sports nutrition, it's also about in which phase probably the athlete is in. I'm sure Arun will agree if, you know, the but the periodization really matters, you know, if he's in his preparatory phase, off phase, you know, his competitive phase, I think then the regulation becomes very important, like especially the protein and the creatine, because all these things cannot be taken in the same quantity throughout, you know, because the athlete is in a different phase. But again, when you talk from a very generic, you know, general point of view here, assuming that the crowd is all, you know, a general crowd then you don't really need to periodize like you like he said you know adding your uh, vitamin d b12 especially you know for vegetarians out there uh, you know all these things become very necessary and probably if you're a female and if you are again having your hormonal imbalances and all then yeah again it has to be tailor made but in general i think now the need of the r is vitamin d b12 and all of these things because most of them are vitamin d b12 deficient iron is very important i think that is again very important in females so these days it's very essential to supplement iron too even folic acid as a matter of fact and um, since i deal with a lot of women crowd uh, iron and calcium again you know with bone health and anemia and all of these things because india again we have this iron deficiency anemia which is so prevalent so I think these are the things which most of the general population should consider. Uh, so, yeah, I think most of it he's been, you know, he's covered it all. So I think I would just like to add on with these. Right. Um, I'm a little bit on the fence when it comes to iron, though. I, 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 and I'm just going to throw it out there that, you know, um, I think iron is something that I would always do it under a doctor's supervision because um, it, it is something that can go either ways. So, yes, what you've said is true. But I think uh, one statistic that I have realized after doing this for 11 years is that most women in India are by default low in hemoglobin. Um, so call it anecdotal, but what I have so, so observed is like including my own wife who is um, who competes in, in a category called bikini in bodybuilding, but her hemoglobin tends to be a little low. Uh, I generally feel if their physical stats are fine, where their blood pressure, energy levels, activity, all that is fine. And if they're not really showing any physical symptoms and it's better not to play with their you know iron intake too much um natural sources are always there you can always add some vitamin c to increase their absorption and all because i've seen doctors being very defensive about how much iron somebody should take and how long they should take and things like that and women you know on the other hand for example um, just going a little bit off topic a lot of women out there, since you've been talking about women, um, tend to supplement with collagen, tend to supplement with very high dosages of biotin. Um, now, for example, if some of you get your blood tests done and uh, if you were to check your thyroid levels, being on a chronic period of biotin supplementation where you're taking something like 10,000 mcg per day can actually affect your test, test results when it comes to your free T3 and free T4. Um, so a lot of doctors even even suggest that it's better to get off biotin for some time. Yes, it's important for your hair and nails and things like that. But yes, women can get a little caught up with their looks and other things. But some of these supplements also need to be cycled. You can't just perpetually be on them forever. So 
just a few words of precaution from my end. That's it. Right. right. I think I would like to add on. So, you know, in supplements, you have things which are essential and things which are, again, really just meant for the, you know, cosmetic stuff. So, exactly. yeah, I agree. So, iron, again, like you said, I agree. It's only in case of, you know, very serious things like female athlete triad, which we come across more or less. So, it really matters. But again, I think every person has a different body, like you said. So, it ideally depends on their performance and how the body or the person is reacting. Right. So, right. Right. right, right. So um, the key takeaway, of course, uh, supplements uh, can be beneficial, but uh, this is for somebody who is out there for general fitness or for sports nutrition as such. But each of you would really want to go meet an expert and get your individual analysis done because there could be underlying medical conditions or any other concerns that may uh, require special attention. So you would uh, remember this is not a substitute for individual medical advice. Um, with that, uh, Arun, I quickly want to ask you uh, you know a lot of people are you know very busy and they always have this concern that I do not have the time so any practical tips for busy individuals to integrate healthy eating habits into their lifestyle along with their workout routine it's all about priorities um you know again being into performance coaching and um, I've had the privilege of working with clients like you know Nikhil Kamath from Zero Dha, um, you know, Bhupesh Reddy, who's running Brent Corp, um, you know, um, Vicky Koshal, I mean, Katrina Kaif. I've had the privilege of working with some of these guys. And because health is a priority for them, they are, you know, willing to, you know, deploy those resources and put those things in place, whether it's having a private chef, whether it's signing up with a health meal service, uh, whether it's even sh sharing their schedule in advance so that they, you know, have their food and everything carried. Um, for example, I recently went to Goa and on my Instagram, I was posting stories about how I carried my meals. I, you know, asked my chef to make my food. I put all of it in the deep freezer for a day and I packed it in a bag, put ice packs around it. The food was still cold by the time I reached uh, my hotel, shoved it all in the fridge. And I told the hotel guys, give me a microwave. And over that weekend, I just had one meal outside, which was at Petisco in Panjim. Uh, but other than that, all my meals, I just had what I generally do on a day to day basis. So, I mean, that might sound a bit obsessive, a bit compulsive, over the top for many. But, you know, I've trained really hard to look and feel the way that I do. And for me, it's not worth it, you know, having that sweet or having that or, you know, skipping a meal or whatever. I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy who had all the excuses in the world. Uh, but then I realized that who am I giving the excuses to? Because, you know, to the world outside, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you know, not that I mean to brag, but my school friends, for example, tell me, bro, I thought you looked good then also, but you just, just took it to another level now. So it's as simple as that. Growing up, I used to look at my dad, you know, who was somebody, you know, smoking six, seven cigarettes a day. Uh, drinking a glass of scotch every night. But at the same time, he would also exercise. He also had a healthy diet. Um, so when I looked at him, I thought, okay, maybe I'll look as good as him. Or maybe I'll look as good as my elder brother. But then I just took it to a whole different level by simply being a little consistent and disciplined on a day-to-day -day basis. So if it's a priority for you, you'll make it happen. And I always give this example as a, like I draw a parallel with anybody's job. Like, for example, imagine that you have a presentation tomorrow and you're not ready. You're ready to sacrifice your sleep. You're ready to ignore your child's tantrums. You're ready to ignore plans that you might have made with your partner or whatever it is. Because you're so zoned in that I need to be prepared for this presentation. It's like a life and death thing. So when you have that sort of an attitude towards your job or towards your business, why are you not having that attitude towards your health? Yes. It's as simple as that. And if I may add one more point, I genuinely feel that, you know, having a structure uh, where I know what time I train, what, what time I eat my meals and making sure where I'm getting my food from has actually made me more productive. Okay. Um, one thing that I see with a lot of uh, busy individuals, especially the ones who don't really have a structure to the day, they have this constant stress. Like, how much work will I get done today? 
Now, if you know that these are, this is the time that you have during the day, like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. I have this one hour. I have this rest of this time, you know, so maybe in the day I have 12 hours. I see so many people using most of that time, just stressing, yeah. losing focus on actually getting anything done. Yeah. And all they're talking about is I have so much to do. I have so much to do. I don't have time. I don't have time. Instead, if you had a structure to the day where you ate good food, felt good, had good energy levels throughout the day. Like yesterday, I posted a story where I had to take a delivery of a vehicle of mine at 11 in the night because I didn't have time at all. And somebody watching that story said, even at 11, you look like you can go and do five more training sessions. Like yeah. you look so fresh and you've been awake since four. Where do you think that energy and vigor comes from? It comes from the fact that I'm feeding myself that way. I'm, you know, every single day for the last 23 years of my life, I've consistently focused on prioritizing my health, which is why on certain days I'm able to push myself. Right. And I'm able to get, get a lot done. So yeah. if people actually can wrap their head around that, like imagine a vehicle which is serviced regularly, you put really clean fuel in it. It it never breaks down. Why? You just do a general service on it one, you know, once in a year or once in six months, and the vehicle keeps running smoothly. Right. What Why? we because you're is people, after it. you know, push fitness for the last thing. You know, it's the last thing on their list. If if I have time, I will do this. Or they, it, again, like you and said, sadly they learn the it the hard way. Yes, yes. And sadly they Have will learn it the hard way because Absolutely. Because you're not going to be in your 20s and 30s forever. You're not going to be Teflon forever. Eventually, you'll realize that, you know, I mean, it's very sad that now when I hear cases that there are 24-year-olds, 25-year-olds getting cancer, getting diabetes. And I'm not saying that they're doing it purposely. But, I mean, we have to wake up to the fact that stress has been at the highest level in our, you know, in, in our human civilization as it is right now. Yeah. And if we don't, realize that as important it is for us to work hard towards our job, achieve our financial goals, achieve our family goals, it is equally important to make sure that you're actually going to stick around and be alive in your 50s and 60s and 70s and so on, so that you can actually enjoy the fruits of those labor. Yes, prioritize so, your health, uh, just like exactly. you know, so, everything else. Prioritize your health as much as you prioritize everything else. Life is all about balance. I'm right. not saying stop doing everything and just focus on your health. No way. I, I mean, if I don't train people and earn money, how the hell am I going to support my bodybuilding? That's right. where my funding comes from. Right. But as important as it is for me to earn that money, I know that in my industry, it's also very important for me to look good. Right. So it's, it's a constant investment. But I train 12 people in a day. I still make sure I get seven, eight hours of sleep. I'm eating my meals on the go. I mostly eat most of my meals in the car. I'm not stuck on those things like, oh, I have to sit on a dining table and, right. you know, have my plate arranged properly. I need to get my meals. So for right. that, whatever I need to do, I need to do it. So yeah. it's all about prioritizing. If it's a priority for you, you'll make it happen. If not, you'll find an excuse like something. <laughs> Which there are plenty out there. Right. Um, Sharanya, uh, would you want to uh, add to that? Uh, people say, I don't have time. Uh, how do you eat right when you don't have time? We, it's yeah. uh, time for us to wrap up as well. So I'd request you to. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think, you know, uh, for you to eat right, even if you have to feel good, that amount of confidence, like, you know, you was talking about comes when you feel first confident about yourself. So I think even to have that confidence and to, you know, carry yourself in a particular way, we all want to look good, right? Like we all want to look younger and smarter, leaner, fitter. So I feel it's just an excuse, like how you was talking about. And, uh, you know, it's just that you don't really want to do it because if you really want to do it you will somehow make time for it and I personally believe that uh, you don't really have to do it like in a very professional capacity like 12 hours or 13 hours like how people in the glamour industry do you, I, I still feel you can afford 30 minutes for yourself or 40 minutes for yourself to you know focus on your health because you're not really doing a big favor to anybody else so I think it's yeah it's about being nutritionally disciplined too I think that's the word that I would like to use in here so I think being a little bit of disciplined nutritionally also would help. Like, you know, uh, if you can balance it out, like he said, you don't really need a table and you don't need that ambience. So it's just about focusing, maybe having a little bit of priority and maybe a little bit of discipline. So I think that will get and, your goals. Technology and understand that health and nutrition is as important yeah. as your job or meeting or that presentation exactly. that 
to meet uh, make the next day absolutely thank you so much sharanya and arun for all those insights uh, from uh, you know an expert uh, point of view uh, attendees who are uh, in the session if you have any questions uh, please do send them across uh, to us uh, we are uh, sharing the mail id as well in the chat box and before we leave let me uh, give a quick word about the fitness summit that we have on the 8th of june it's called the move a fitness summit uh, 8th of june at st john's auditorium in bengaluru starts at 9 a.m uh, registrations are still on you can uh, register using the link in the chat box below and there's also a special discount uh the coupon code for which is also shared in the chat box thank you so much sharanya and arun for all the insights that you gave us a lot of information and a lot of uh, myths and misconceptions that were broken and uh, some key takeaways were of course don't stress over your food and workout enjoy them and uh, have a good mix on your plate don't look at your plate as uh, you know numbers and calories but make sure you would intake everything don't follow any fad or you know influencer diet just blindly uh, make sure it is sustainable and find time for fitness and nutrition because that is very very important and both of these are equally important don't go work out and not eat right or eat right and not move at all neither of this will work research has proven and our experts have spoken as well thank you so much for joining us thank you attendees it was a wonderful session look forward to working with you again thank you thank you thank you